one of the things I really like about pub battles is with the chit draw you can do the same strategy time and again and it'll play out differently every time. I have my divider set to one third of an infantry move. Ordinarily, a unit can move one movement stick. If it encounters any terrain, which is pretty much generally the case, it can only move two thirds. By setting my compass at one third, I can easily determine how far an infantry block can move. That was Fitz John Porter's 5th Corps. Next is Burnside's 9th Corps. I don't want to attack across the lower bridge yet. So I'll just move it forward a little ways. I don't need to bother with measuring this. Next is the Federal Artillery. They cross at the ford just beyond Pie House and will establish themselves on the hills. As per gentlemen's rules, I establish with my opponent that I have over half of this block extending out from behind this block so the rear artillery unit can fire. One other artillery block establishes itself on the heights just below the middle bridge. Now Longstreet has been activated. He won't be moving, but his artillery spots the Union artillery. However, its fire is ineffective. Mansfield's 12th Corps eases forward. I want to make sure and allow at least half a space, half a block width, so that if this block has to retreat, it won't sweep any units along with it. Hooker's 1st Corps advances forward. Again, no need to measure. Now Jackson is drawn. His artillery will fire at the Union artillery on the hill. Their fire was also ineffective. For those familiar with the Battle of Antietam, these are the East Woods, this is the Cornfield, this is the West Woods. This grove here is called the North Woods. Sumner will occupy the North Woods and guard his right flank. Again, no need to worry about measuring. For folks that aren't used to miniatures rules and are used to hexes, one thing that might be surprising is how rarely you actually have to measure. Because if you know you can move this far, you got a pretty good idea how far you guys can go. Pleasanton's Cavalry crosses Antietam Creek. Thus ends the early morning hours of turn one. Now we have the mid-morning hours of turn two. First drawn is Fitz John Porter, the Lion of Antietam. True to his name and his reputation, he charges the West Woods. And now Federal Artillery returns salutations to their Confederate counterparts. First salvo. The Union artillery utterly disrupts and drives off their Confederate counterparts. The other Union artillery can't see this block, it's behind the crest. So they fired these troops. Driving off the light troops and skirmishers that were out in front. And finally the Union artillery below the middle bridge. They pivot and return greetings to Longstreet's artillery. Causing some disruption. Next up is Jackson. He sends a detachment to disrupt the attack on the West Woods. He positions a detachment of Ewell's men along with the artillery should the Federal troops break through. Sumner 2nd Corps attacks on the opposite flank. It may seem early, but Longstreet moves up his bags and unpacks them. This allows him to rally his artillery. Hooker commits his corps. Mid-morning combat? Battle in the West Woods. Jackson's forces have cover. Jackson's remaining troops fall back rather than trying to hold a compromised position. And now it's turn three, late morning. And late in the morning, Franklin's Sixth Corps arrives. And Sumner presses the attack. Now again, as gentlemen, my opponent and I agreed that this was less than a half a base width space. Therefore, this block could not move through there and attack this block. Similarly, this block cannot flank this, this combat or this combat. Argument averted. Not wanting to get cut off above Sharpsburg, Jackson has his troops fall back. And his biggest train moves back. Burnside jockeys his position. Longstreet's artillery fires again at the Federal artillery. Driving it from the hill. McClellan orders Mansfield forward. Alright, that is the limit to where Mansfield's troops can reach this turn. His troops occupy the sunken road. Now the Federal artillery over here can see nothing between friendly troops and this hill right here. So they move it forward. Pleasanton and his cavalry occupy the hill just west of Antietam Creek. Fitz John Porter falls hard on first available. Stewart's cavalry under Hampton moved to stem the Union tide. 
and Hooker moves to bolster Sumner's attack on the north. Turn 3, late morning combat. The cavalry attack. <laughs> Sumner's troops are driven back, but Hooker's men hold. The delaying attack, having served its purpose, the southern cav merely ride off. Fitz John Porter's drive for glory. <laughs> After a terrific bloodletting, all that remains is one battered southern block. We open up with Sumner's drive on the Confederate left. Fitz John Porter has been drawn, but his corps is no more. And he rides back to McClellan's headquarters and says there, I have attacked until I have nothing left. Remember me well. Longstreet's artillery opens up on the Union artillery. Now the Union artillery prepares to recover. Jackson gives no ground and prepares to fight. Burnside unpacks bags and rebuilds the Union artillery batteries. Franklin's Corps prepares to move out. Mansfield advances his corps forward and tries to do what Porter could not. Pleasanton's cavalry charges into downtown Sharpsburg. And Hooker again supports Sumner's assault. Hampton's cavalry falls back to the baggage, and Stuart brings the rest of the cavalry over to the Confederate left. Houston, I think we have a problem. Combat at high noon. First the cavalry charge on the detachment guarding Sharpsburg. <coughs> the detachment flees. And here you can see the casualties, by the way. On this side of the boxes, I have the non-infantry casualties that don't affect the breaking of your army. You need 50% of the infantry blocks lost. Lee has lost three detachments and Jackson's artillery. And over here, we see Fitz John Porter's corps that is no more. All right, back to the action. Mansfield's drive. Can he do what Fitz John Porter could not? Under this accelerated assault, Jackson is carefully pulling back. He's counting on AP Hill. Certainly the Light Division is showing up soon. It's early afternoon. The afternoon's action begins with Franklin's Sixth Corps driving forward. As Jackson anticipated, AP Hill comes marching up at the double. Jackson elects to not unpack bags and move them farther back at this point in time. How far can he fall back? Burnside licks his chops and explodes forward. Longstreet is an old war horse and he has a plan. Don't fight the battles you can't win. Fight the battles you can win. Hooker leaps forward but he can't keep up with Jackson's retreat. Pleasanton sends his cavalry forward as Union cavalry has never been sent forward before. Sumner's men march hard. Now this might look too close as, in, as if they're in field of fire, but cavalry has no field of fire and DHL is running away so he's not showing field of fire that way either. Sumner's pursuit is relentless. The federal artillery recovers. The other Union artillery prepares to support any success against Longstreet. Mansfield races forward and organizes his corps. And Stuart moves to show Pleasanton what exactly it means to fight Southern cavalry. And now we have combat in the mid-afternoon. Longstreet's defense at the lower ford. That hurt. The Union flank collapses. Now, outside of Sharpsburg, the artillery in front fires first. Confederate grape drives back Slocum's men. The artillery falls back. Outflanked by cavalry, Walker's division fights on. The cavalry rides off. Stewart's attack on Pleasanton's cavalry. They don't stand a chance and ride off. Now it's turn six, late afternoon. Turn six, seven, and eight left. The south has only lost one infantry block. The north has lost four. Looks like another battle tough for the north. But let's see how it plays out. Federal artillery prepares to begin shelling again. Pleasanton pulls his cavalry back to recover from his irrational exuberance. Jackson unpacks bags and reforms his line. Longstreet rallies his troops and stiffens his line. And Stewart completes the line. Franklin redoubles his assault. Mansfield orders his corps forward. Sumner's men leap into action. And Hooker orders his corps in to join the drive. Not to be left out in the cold, Burnside drives forward. Once again, the South has their backs up against the wall. But once again, the Northern hope for victory might be dashed on this wall. 
The whole line is assaulted. Starting with Burnside. Ultimately, Hood's Texans drive Burnside back. Franklin's Sixth Corps drives outside of Sharpsburg. The Southern troops are driven back. Stewart's cavalry, not ready to face full-on assault by infantry, falls back. But here, Hooker runs into A.P. Hill's division. A.P. Hill drives out the lead elements of the attack and then falls back to cover the bags. Sumner's attack on Confederate left. And now it's very intense. The bags are exposed. If any of these Union Corps get picked first, they can get at these bags. And it's over for the Southerners. But the first chip drawn is cavalry. Stewart's cavalry. And just like in the best stories, they ride in to save the day. And the Federal artillery is drawn next. The only clear line shot the Federal artillery has is here on this southern unit and they drive it back and Longstreet is drawn how fortuitous he considers flanking Lee's attack but realizes this exposes the bags he holds he seals any access to the bags from the southern route his troops on the hill stay outside of artillery range but remain a constant threat the bags have held another turn apparently and next, Jackson is drawn. This is very fortuitous. Everyone recovers. Hooker continues the drive. And the Summoner drives forward. Summoner and Hooker bring their bags forward. They must be able to sustain this drive. Except, there's only two turns left in the day. So this turn they drive forward, next turn they can unpack, but that's the end of the day. Wouldn't be prudent. Not gonna do it. Summoner and Hooker ha have a confab right there. Burnside's core is exhausted. They stick to covering the bags. Pleasanton's cavalry recovers. Maybe they can make one last effort. Franklin's corps holds. Ready for combat again. Of course, as is their option, the cavalry rides off before combat. This does expose the bags, but there is a, they weren't going to win this combat, and there is a chance that they'll move before these units do next turn, and they can cover the bags again, and the day will end. Over here, A.P. Hill is defending the bags from Hooker's assault. And now things are dire. A.P. Hill's division, after their grueling march, had no energy to hold from Hooker's fresh core assault. Sumner's attack on the Confederate left. Man, this is close. Last turn. Turn 8, evening turn. Both bags are exposed. Now it comes down to the chit draw. When I play two-fisted solo, I don't use the alter turn order rule. I play them as I draw them. But if you were playing an another opponent, this next turn you would both be rolling furiously trying to make sure you got on first. Of the ten chits able to be drawn each turn, only three are southern. But the Confederates succeed on a four or less, the Union on a three or less. There's a good chance they could get the uh, draws they needed. But we'll see how this one plays out. It's a close game when it comes down to the who can draw first. Well. The South has been dogged by bad draws all game. They were drawing and going early, earlier in the game, so that they couldn't choose where to fight. And now in this last turn, they're going last. And first to move is Franklin, and he will contact the bags. Next to Sumner, he can contact those bags. Now, the advantage, if you want to call it that, is the South moves last. That means when they move, they can pack up their bags which gives the northern troops a minor victory. If they had sacked the bags, they'd have a major victory. So once again, night falls, and just like he did historically, Lee escapes across the Potomac. Good game.